Okay, so um, I want to look at uh, elephants in Islam because on the whole, as uh, we'll see at this conference, uh, there's a tendency to look at elephants very much either in the Hindu-Buddhist tradition uh, or sometimes in the Western tradition, but Islam rather gets uh, left out. And um, elephants are there then from the very beginning because one of the surahs of the Quran is al feel the elephant, not the elephants, as I said in my abstract, which is incorrect. Um, and although this is a short surah, and therefore it comes towards the end of the Quran, uh, it's almost certainly an early revelation to the Prophet from the time of his Meccan teaching. So the crucial verse is that first one, have you not seen how thy Lord did with the men of the elephant? And because you're not allowed to picture living beings in uh, strict Islam, uh, you can use calligraphy, and this is the whole of Surah 105 uh, in the form of an elephant. Now, the usual um, interpretation of this cryptic sentence, or cryptic verse, is that this it refers to an attack by a Christian ruler of Yemen to tear down the Kaaba in, in Mecca, the, the center of worship uh, of Islam. And according to the story, the elephant probably followed by a number of other elephants, uh, refused to advance uh, on Mecca. Now, on top of that, this invasion or failed invasion uh, allegedly happened in the year of the birth of the prophet. Uh, or more exactly, the prophet was in his mother's womb uh, at the time of the invasion. Now, the problem with this in historical terms is that Abraha uh, died around 554 CE, um, and there are no elephants mentioned in the one inscription, the one Himarite, uh, Himyarite, sorry, inscription, uh, which might uh, refer to this. Nevertheless, uh, the story of Abraha and the elephants is repeated endlessly. In, this is children's stories. It's on the internet absolutely uh, everywhere. And it's generally believed by Muslims to be uh, a correct um, relation of what, what the prophet was talking of, what the revelation was about in the Quran. So the elephant from this is mighty. The, the birth of the prophet in the year of the elephant is uh, an omen of success. But at the same time, the elephants are the animals of the infidel who are determined to root out Islam. Right? So the elephant in Islam is born under an ambiguity, both positive uh, and negative. And there's a fascinating story uh, rather later, of an Islamic general who has defeated uh, in the Persian Afghan lands um, a, a, enemies with elephants, captured the elephants, but refuses to integrate them into his own forces. And he cites Abraha's story as the reason why Muslims should not have war elephants. Uh, and this is a fascinating image which I found on the internet. It's a 17th or 18th century illustration of Abraha's uh, story. Um, as uh, told by Ad-Damiri. And you can see that the, 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 the way it's been done is actually quite a long way away from the story itself because the elephants are circling the Kaaba. They're actually threatening and circling the, the holy uh, center of Islam. This is a very negative image in many ways. And it's reinforced then by the fact that early Muslim campaigns, the Muslims are on horses and camels, but they come up against enemies who are fielding uh, war elephants especially Persians um, and Indians. And this is a, uh, an Armenian uh, miniature of the uh, war elephants that the Sasanian dynasty of Persia fielded against them. The Parthian dynasty had not used war elephants, but with the movement from the Parthian to the Sasanians in the 3rd century of the Common Era, um, there is a return of the war elephant in Persia. Now, the other thing which makes the elephant gives the elephant a bad name, so to speak, in Islam is the fact that uh, it becomes unclean meat. The Quran itself only forbids uh, pork, blood, and um, meat which is not killed in the in prescribed way. But fairly quickly, Sharia law uh, builds up uh, a whole series of uh, interdicts on eating me uh, meat, either because it's completely uh, forbidden, or in the case of the elephant and other meats, because it is repulsive or unbecoming, makru, within the uh, five... Um, full system of, of Islam. And exactly why the elephant should have fallen into this category is not entirely clear. Uh, note that this is very different from the Hindu-Buddhist idea, that the elephant is too sacred to eat. Uh, here in the Islamic tradition, the elephant is too disgusting to eat. Okay? Uh, the, the end result is the same, you don't eat elephant, 
but the reasons for it are completely different. Now, one possibility is that because the elephant is seen as related to the pig by metamorphosis, this is what al says, I don't know what this means. Metamorphosis is one of these rather tricky words. Uh, it's also suggested that it's a hairless or near hairless animal like the pig again. But the usual thing you'll find all over the internet, and interestingly, modern Muslims are constantly asking for a fatwa, why can't I eat elephant? Now, why are they asking this question? I just don't know. But all over the internet, you've got the tower which are answering, saying you can't eat elephant because the elephant has tusks which are equivalent to fangs, and you can't eat carnivores, and therefore you can't eat elephant. Now, given that the elephant is a herbivore, this is a really peculiar kind of argument. But it's reinforced by the idea that the elephant is a fighting animal, not a peaceful flight animal, uh, like uh, most herbivores. And something which I haven't put here, which I've only discovered uh, literally just before coming here, is that some uh, ulama in East Africa say that the elephant does not chew the cud and therefore is to be assimilated uh, to unclean meat. Uh, this is a very interesting book about this, unfortunately, in uh, German, but, and although it's meant to be about the slaughtering of animals, in fact, there's a lot in this book uh, about uh, which meats are unclean to Muslims and which Muslims and why. Now, there are some exceptions made. We, we spoke earlier before the break about medical treatises, uh, and the same is true in Islam. There are medical treatises which uh, recommend bits of the elephant, uh, but note that these are penned by Christian Arabs. Right? But I only discovered this after quite a bit of searching, that although these were widely read by Muslims and written within an Islamic framework, they're actually written by Christians. This is the Manafi al Hayyan uh, at the time of the Baghdad uh, Caliphate. I couldn't um, get the uh, internet to let me download the picture of the elephant, so <laughs> I had to give you another one. Uh, now, this begins to change in Islam, arguably, with the Persian cultural revival. One of the great paradoxes of Islam is that the Arab Muslims conquered the Persians militarily, but the Persians then conquered the Arabs <coughs> culturally. And it's this kind of great reversal of fortunes which occurs really with the foundation of the Abbasid um, Caliphate from 750 of the Common Era, uh, which leads to the first return of the elephant. The elephant in Persian culture was extremely um, uh, important and, and revered and so elephants now become mounts but note they don't become animals of war they just become symbols of power and strength and being important this is one of the most famous of these elephants because it was given to Frederick II Hohenstaufen, the ruler of Sicily and was used <coughs> in the capture of Cremona uh, in Italy note that North Europeans didn't have much idea of what an elephant really looked like and so we have this rather strange uh, depiction in Matthew Paris's text. Another thing which happens in the Abbasid period is the rise of ivory carving. Early Islam hardly carves an ivory at all, and here actually Persia had no real tradition either, for reasons which I can't understand. So it's essentially Western and Indian traditions uh, which lead to this flowering uh, of carving. Now note that, of course, carving very quickly tends to flout the Sharia ban on the depiction of living beings. Uh, this is a ban which has been much flouted in Islamic history, uh, but it's also something which is then used as a stick with which to beat people uh, who've done this. This is an example from Al-Andalus, from uh, Iberia, and you can see there's plenty uh, in this ivory carving. There's plenty of living beings uh, of various uh, kinds. Also, the opposite uh, caliphate sees a huge flowering of science. It's often said this is a recovery of Greek science. This is actually very misleading. What it is is a kind of synthesis uh, of European science, of Egyptian science, of Indian science. Anything that the uh, first Muslims could get uh, their hands on was translated and was used to build up that extraordinary flowering of early Islamic science. And within that, we have uh, the this uh, fascinating character, al Jahiz who writes the first great treatise uh, on, um, uh, elef uh, on animals, sorry, the seven-volume Kitab al Hayawan, the, the book of animals, um, and who really uh, tried to base this on reality. He took great pleasure in telling Aristotle he was wrong and in inspecting elephants which had been sent to Iraq and seeing for himself what they were really like and uh, turning to Indian sources to find out about elephants uh, and this is really quite a comprehensive and encyclopedic, although he does actually repeat some of the mistakes of Aristotle, and it's by no means 
uh, a modern thing. Again, this is um, Jerhes's book of animals, but uh, the giraffe is uh, often used as an illustration, and I couldn't find the elephant one. There are many, many editions of Jerhes's work. Now, one of the most perplexing things I've found, and which I really don't understand, is that with the eruption of Central Asian Turks uh, into Islam, either as uh, uh, Mamluks, as um, uh, war slaves, uh, or as rulers, what we actually uh, get is uh, something which is totally unexpected. You, the, the Turks come from horse country. You'd expect them to reject the elephant in the name of the horse. In fact, what they do is they become culturally more Persian than the Persians, uh, and they make the crucial further step that they now adopt the uh, elephant as an animal uh, of war. Um, note that there are some exceptions to this, and the, great, uh, the, the second great uh, encyclopedic uh, compendium on animals of uh, Muhammad al-Damiri, a 14th century uh, Mamluk Egypt, although he's favorable to the elephant in some ways, there, there are very clear signs in what he writes that the elephant is somehow not quite Islamic, and uh, particularly he notes that the Indians worship it or that the Indians magnify it too much. And there's a distinct hint that he's saying that the, that the elephant is a source of polytheism, a source of worshipping more than uh, one god. This is his great um, book, uh, which has, again, gone into many editions. Now, in India, we have a, another Mamluk uh, state, the Delhi Sultanate, uh, and here elephants are definitely adopted on large scale, uh, and the argument is that the Delhi Sultanate uh, acts on controlling both uh, fluxes of horses and fluxes of elephants in order to uh, maintain uh, its power. The Mongols uh, reject elephants initially. They slaughter them. They refuse to have anything to do with them. And yet this magic of the elephant uh, over time takes over and Timur uh, takes a series of elephants from Delhi when he captures the town 1398. This is the uh, Delhi Sultan fighting off uh, Timur. Um, in early modern times, then, the elephant reaches its uh, preeminence in Islam, and this is largely due to the uh, Mughal dynasty, which we've already had mentioned in various uh, other presentations, and perhaps, above all, to Akbar the Great, the very long-lived uh, Mughal uh, emperor, who's also, of course, extraordinarily controversial because he's seen as someone who betrayed Islam and who tried to create a new religion, which would be a kind of synthesis of Hinduism um, and Islam. Uh, so his reputation is both great but also murky. Um, now, it's interesting that also this is a period of technological change in which firearms are being adopted much more widely. And so although we see that uh, Akbar uses uh, elephants a great deal in his army, they're increasingly used in a different way. Because if you try and use them as frontline troops, as tanks, as they used to be used, they simply stampede. We heard about the fireworks, which make them nervous, well, you can imagine what a huge, great cannon is going to do if it's fired straight at them, right? So elephants tend to stampede, to turn back on their own troops, to uh, destroy their own infantry. And for this reason, for all the razzmatazz about Mughal armies, uh, the reality is that you're using more and more female elephants, and you're using them more and more uh, to carry baggage and to carry cannon, to pull cannon behind the lines. So they are used less and less, in fact, as offensive this is a fascinating picture. You probably, perhaps can't see it terribly well, but the elephants here are pushing. You've got uh, oxen or bullocks which are pulling these huge cannons, and the elephants are helping along uh, behind. Again, interestingly, behind. At the same time, they're under the Mughals, they definitely are extraordinarily important symbols of power and majesty. They're a favorite subject of painting. Now, of course, painting is against the Sharia ban on the picturing of living beings, although we get lots and lots of miniature paintings at this time. They're also used in animal fights. Animal fights, again, are banned by the Sharia. So there's a whole series of rather un-Islamic things which are beginning to happen uh, in this Mughal dynasty. This is an example of an elephant fight. Uh, I think this is actually in Rajasthan, so it's in an area which is under rather light uh, Mughal control. Um, from India, then, um, elephants are exported to the other two great gunpowder empires, the Ottomans and the Safavids, and uh, Mikhail... Um, um, I've forgotten second name, uh, argues that, he, that they, there's a real spread of symbolic uh, capital in this. But note, they're not coming as war elephants. The only known time that the, an Ottoman sultan takes elephants on campaign, he takes four of them somewhere into the um, steppes, and it's very unimportant and marginal. So they are simply accepted into menageries, 
uh, they're there to impress Western businesses, amongst others, as to the power uh, of the Safavid and Ottoman uh, emperors. This is a, uh, an elephant portrayed in the text of the time. I'm not exactly sure what this text is, but it's quite interesting the way in which it's portrayed. It is very much a, a dark and threatening uh, picture. Southeast Asia then, which has its own wild elephants, um, we have a flowering too with a fascination with the Mughals. The Mughal model is, is taken on board by Southeast Asian rulers, particularly in Aceh and North Sumatra at this time. But we also see elements of Hindu Buddhism remaining. The fascination with white or so-called white elephants, the fascination with elephants of more than two tusks. Uh, all of this shows that there's an underlying non-Islamic or pre-Islamic um, element here. Where you don't get wild elephants, as in Java, they're imported and they're used entirely as a source of um, power but not of fighting. This is a, a, a scene on the north coast of Java where the a local ruler is welcoming thank you, the, um, the, the Dutch uh, in the early 17th century. Finally then, uh, in um, uh, modern times, I think what we're getting is a return to a more negative view of elephants. Uh, in Islam, and I think this is partly because ele elephants are um, ascribed tra uh, all sorts of transgressions of Islamic <coughs> law. However, some radical Muslims uh, suggest that the verse in the Quran that I cited right at the very beginning is not to do with Yemen, because it's counterintuitive that you could march elephants from Yemen up to, to Mecca. And it's much more likely that this is actually about Petra, about the Jordanian, today the Jordanian city of Petra, where we have uh, these uh, famous uh, capitals discovered in 1921, and it's probably not about an attack on the Muslims, it's probably about something that happened to the people in Petra, and it's a, another story completely. But this may or may not be true, the verse in the Quran is extremely cryptic. Uh, in the Southeast Asian context, we find uh, elephants disappearing, uh, notably in Aceh, at a time when Hadrami Arabs are bringing in a much more Sharia-minded uh, kind of idea. For instance, a fatwa comes from Mecca that you can't have women rulers. Aceh had had four women rulers in a row, but uh, the uh, Shafi um, authorities in, in Mecca say that's not right. And I think there, there's a, a real sense, I mean, this, I, this is circumstantial, I don't have any evidence, but there's a sense that this Sharia-minded reform going on leads to the marginalization uh, of elephants, and they disappear completely from court and city uh, by the early 19th century. And fascinatingly, it's the Dutch army which reintroduces uh, tamed elephants uh, later in the 19th century. In contrast, in Java, we get a very syncretic Islam, great mixture of Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, elephants continue as royal symbols. This is a modern artistic uh, depiction, but it's interesting that the elephant has been kept as a, as a sign of Yogyakarta, the sultan of Yogyakarta's power. Uh, in South Asia, I found some interesting hints. Uh, Muslim rebels in 1857 against the British compare the British to Abraha and to his elephants. Uh, and Kipling, the father of uh, Rudyard Kipling, uh, makes this affirmation, although I don't know what it's based on, that the elephant is more of a Hindu animal and the horse is more of a Muslim animal. Of course, this is at a time when, under British rule, religion is becoming more and more of an identity marker in South Asia. Uh, here are the two... Uh, Kipling's Père et Fils. Um, John Lockwood's book on, popular book on animals in India is a very interesting read, but one's never quite sure how much to trust it. And finally, um, there is the, the barrier to conversion, or perhaps one should say really the, the barrier to orthopraxis in Islam of eating uh, elephant meat. Uh, we know that there are peoples in Southeast Asia who eat it and who, uh, it's said, um, this constitutes a barrier uh, to their becoming Muslim, but the, the, this is probably greatest in, in Africa, and I'd love it if the Africanists amongst you could tell me who eats elephant, uh, who doesn't, to what extent elephant eating may or may not be an obstacle to either converting or to the orthopraxis uh, of Islam. This is elephant meat being dried in uh, equatorial Africa, where most of the elephant meat is consumed today is in the Congo sort of uh, area. You try it into a kind of biltong that keeps extremely well. So in conclusion then, uh, I think the Islamic side of elephants has not been looked at very much, and I think there is actually quite a strong Islamic bias against elephants. Despite the positive views, despite the Mughal Empire, I think that they are seen as animals of hostile infidels, the animals of prohibited activities, of haram activities, 
and in particular uh, of uh, eating. Thank you.